This is John Nugent. I'm Sam Long. And I'm Ron Peters. Welcome to the After Class Podcast. Because the best conversations happen after class. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the After Class Podcast. John and Sam have uh, taken it upon themselves to entrust in me one last time. I think this is my uh, final uh, grace here to try to introduce the podcast without screwing it up somehow. It's a three strike situation. <laughs> so am I, I'm on my third strike here. We're going to see if I can do this without just totally butchering it and getting us in on a, on a bad foot. Uh, the first thing we want to do is remind everybody, as we said last week, that uh, look in the upcoming Christian Standard uh, magazine, the December issue for the uh, After Class podcast first, uh, first time column. It's a regular column that will be in the magazine called uh, Biblically Correct. And we're looking forward to doing that on a regular basis, a uh, kind of humorous uh, look at various things that take place in the Christian church, church at large. So look for that in the December issue of the Christian Standard uh, magazine. It should and be toward the end of the magazine. That was the back page. Yeah, I think it's yeah, the back page. And it's called the Church of Christ Nativity Heist <laughs> is the title of the first column that we've put out there. So yeah, hopefully you get to enjoy that. Yes, hope you do. If you don't think it's funny, please don't tell us. And Just if kidding. you do think it's funny, you can. But yeah, keep your criticism to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this week... Yes. Well, this week what? Oh, apparently it's my turn. Yes, we're handing this <laughs> off to you now, Sam. Lead us in. Okay. So this week we are continuing our discussion of walking through the story of the Bible, more specifically the story of God, uh, what God is doing in this world. Last week we left off discussing the uh, Genesis chapter 3 and what happened in the garden and the incident uh, with, the, uh, with the dragon fruit. <laughs> and and with the, it was an apple. the consequence, the cursing and the consequences that resulted. And we want to continue the story in early Genesis because we're going to see these things play out. Uh, the interaction between humanity and creation uh, and even God to somewhat. And as we move into chapter four, uh, the last thing we were talking about in regard to curses and consequences had to do with the ground mm-hmm. and tilling it and uh, and humans dealing with it. And guess what? In chapter four, we meet the offspring uh, of Adam and Eve, and they are tillers of the ground, or at least one of them is. Mm-hmm. And they're interacting with creation, uh, perhaps in a different way than was expected in the garden. Um, I find it interesting that as it begins, uh, the man and the wife know each other as the uh, the Hebrew euphemism for... Yada, yada, yada. Is that what it is? <laughs> yes, the Seinfeld <laughs> reference. That's a good reference, finally. Yes, <laughs> yes. It only took 30 episodes, but... Uh, <laughs> yes, this is our 30th episode, by the way. Oh, so. how about that? You got that right. Uh, and uh, they knew each other, uh, had a sexual union, and the result, as we might expect, sexual was... Sexual Congress. <laughs> <laughs> was a child. Uh, and then Eve is proud of that child, saying that she has basically canad, caned a human, a man, with the help of Yahweh. Any uh, interjections? Or Yeah, I, I think we've already seen very subtly one of the consequences of the fall mm-hmm. play out. And that is after, as soon as God is done wrapping up the consequences of sin, in verse 20, it says that the man named his wife Eve. Mm-hmm. Uh, and here we have uh, the use of the formal naming formula. And um, scholars have long observed that to name someone is a power move. Um, you want to say something about that, Sam, in the Old Testament context? <laughs> <laughs> the audience can't see you shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you keep going. I'll uh, interject as required. <laughs> so, um, the attributing of a name to someone is a way of saying that I'm the one that's in a position to name you. And so it's tricky when Israel wants a name for God, God kind of waffles quite a bit on saying, uh, you don't really get a name for me. Uh, you will know me by what you see me doing in world history. The naming conveys a sense of ownership Mm -hmm. uh, of the other. And so one of the consequences of, of the fall would be that, uh, the man would lord over the woman or rule Mm -hmm. over her. 
And the first thing he does after the consequences is, is names his wife. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the, the naming formula here to call the name of is, is the kind of formula that is used uh, by Adam when he's naming the animals. But when Eve is first created out of his rib, um, he says, hey, look, woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and he recognizes that she is Isha. Uh, which is the word for a woman, as opposed to ish, which is the word for a man. In that passage, before the fall, the naming formula is not used, um, but he's just recognizing, hey, here's one that is what I am. I'm recognizing her as a counterpart, but after he is given a told that he will rule over her, he immediately proceeds to name. Mm-hmm. And whether that itself is kind of evidence of him beginning to play the role of a superior Sort of a dominance kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of a, it's really interesting because it seems like a, a subtle move on the part of the text uh, that I'd never really thought about until you began to bring that out, that he doesn't name her before the fall. He just identifies her as the feminine version of me, you know, Ish versus mm-hmm. Isha. But then after the fall, gives her a name as he had done with the animals. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Seeing that as a power play, uh, interesting enough, and that does seem to then set up what you see at the beginning of chapter four with the birth of the child and the naming of the child. Yeah, so in four one, now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Uh, his name, um, you know, Cain is kind of, as you already noted, Kanaz, this mm-hmm. acquiring a man with the help of the Lord. Uh, Eve appears to be the one naming Cain mm-hmm. based on her experience with the Lord of producing a man, mm-hmm. which is very interesting that she's, you know, acquiring or producing a man. You know, in all the other births of the Bible, you produce children right, yeah. <laughs> or offspring or seed. No one gives birth to a man. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and it's interesting to me that uh, she says, with the help of the Lord, you know, doesn't say with the help of my husband, you right. know. I mean, <laughs> earlier in the text it does say that you know Adam knew his wife, but she doesn't seem to acknowledge his contribution. She says with the help of the Lord. Is is she kind of, you know, pushing back at his attempt to name her? You know, you've named me. Oh, you think that you're over me? Well, I'm not going to acknowledge you in the process. And I'm naming the next man I run into. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so it's a counter. You know, the yeah. fall recognizes this power play. Her desires for her husband, but he will rule over her. There's this. We talked about this last week as the battle of the sexes. Right. Is this battle subtly playing out with the naming here? Yeah. At the end of chapter three, where he names the woman, and then she turns around and starts naming a man. Right. Even though it's a baby, the man language is used, and the last time we have that man language is uh, the man will rule over you. Yeah. And it, it does seem to also subtly indicate that you no longer have a cooperative, harmonious relationship. Uh, Eve, instead of saying, together we have produced this child, says, I have done this with the help of Yahweh. So it says Yahweh, right? The Lord? Correct. Okay. Um, so, yeah, is, is, are we seeing now like this breakdown of this harmonious relationship that God intended uh, by her kind of acting unilaterally and autonomously away from her husband. Not to say that she should have been submitting to him, but rather it should have been a a cooperative event, that this whole thing of producing the child, naming the child, should have been something that they'd have done as equal partners, and that seems to be absent. Yeah, and then then she later on goes ahead and names uh, Abel as well. Mm -hmm. Or is it Abel and Seth? (laughs) I believe Seth as well. Yeah. So, yeah, just an interesting development. It's, it's yeah. very subtle. It's hard to know if the author intended this, uh, but the language is strange. The language of naming, yeah. calling a child a man <laughs> is not normal. Yeah. Right. It happens nowhere else in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, maybe Adam was just down at the pool hall hanging out with the guys, you know, having a drink, and the baby was born and he wasn't there. Maybe that's what happened. That's probably it. Because yeah. that's what guys do. Yeah. Although I find it interesting, and I may be the only one, in our culture... <laughs> this is just me. It irks me. I'm not sure why. Uh, where people say, like, they're pregnant, when technically the woman's the pregnant one. I yeah. get what they're saying. Right. It's a, like we're talking about. It's supposed to be unity together. Yeah. I just find that phrase weird. They are pregnant. Talking about a couple. That's all. 
back to the regular schedule program. <laughs> back to the deck. <laughs> well, you know, and okay, sure, fair enough. Uh, you know, I'll uh, take the opposite side and say, well, maybe that's an attempt to to kind of bring back the idea that this is supposed to be a a cooperative event. And yeah, the guy probably had about you know five seconds worth of contribution there, but that it's <laughs> <laughs> oh man, are we gonna have to edit that out? Did I just cross the line? No, but I've had to edit out so many things I wanted to say in response. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, to say, you know, they are pregnant, that, yeah, this is a, this is a team event in the, the production yeah. and reproduction of I'm life. I'm sure whoever came up with that phrase was not trying to uh, <laughs> offset the effects of the fall, but nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know how to continue. So <laughs> that derailed so, us. B- bottom line, there may be in, in the v- verses following the fall and uh, signs of this battle of the sex is yeah. already kind of starting to brew up. Yeah. It may be too subtle to be actual or it may exactly be what's going on mm-hmm. in the text. And yeah. if you want details, you can read my commentary on Genesis one through 11. <laughs> Sweet. But people most pay attention to the Cain and Abel story. And sure. They, they kind of jump right over that to get to Cain and Abel. And the text does spend a lot more time on this. So mm, yeah. what happens here? Uh, nothing good. <laughs> so we have a contrast of two different, uh, we might say, lifestyles. Uh, we have uh, an agrarian type lifestyle and a semi-nomadic, where you have a person who tills the ground and one who herds flocks. Uh, of course, they they do it differently. Um, back then, they didn't have like pens and uh, like fenced right, in yeah. acreage. They went where there was grass, and so yeah. wherever that took them. As opposed to if you're planting crops, you're stationed right there. So you have this contrast, um, and at some point, they both bring offerings to Yahweh. I always find this interesting. We probably could get too far in the weeds here, but how do they know to bring offerings to Yahweh? Yeah. And that's always the question. Right. But How do they know to do that? No answer. Well, I have one, but no one oh, cares. hey, let's hear your answer. Well, it has to do with authorship. And <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that's not where our audience... Too far into the tall yeah, grass, huh? Right. <laughs> Don't go into the tall so, grass. So... <laughs> Um, so they bring their offerings. Uh, verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought for his part firstlings of his flock, the fat portions, which we'll find out much later that the fat part is the good part. Yeah, not according Amen. to most Americans. but Right. This isn't the South Beach diet, but uh, <laughs> it is the good part in most places in the world. Paleo. I keep trying to convince my wife of this. Yeah, she it's keeps biblical. keeps cutting the best part of the meat off of the chicken before That's, she cooks it. Yeah. Mm. And, and I, we all suffer. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I like a little bit because obviously there's flavor in the fat, but yeah, a little too much. Yeah, it's just a little, kind of a little gross to me, but fair well, I mean, enough. That means you don't have fat. enough meat in with your fat. Yeah, that might be disproportionate. Well, yeah, you don't you gotta spread it out. Grizzle. <laughs> 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 but man, like a big glob of fat there, just kind of jiggling on your plate. You know, that just kind of mm. grosses me out. Right. So, <laughs> did you ever see the great outdoors where he has to eat that 96 pound steak and then he eats it and they go, You got to eat the grizzle too? And he's already like, Bleh. Okay. Oh, yeah, I kind of have a vague yeah. memory of that. So, sorry, that's a, that's a Ron type of uh, reference there. <laughs> old sure. and outdated. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'll hold that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a minute. That was an age joke. Yeah. Jerk. And so they bring their um, they bring their things and it says that Yahweh had regard for Abel's, which is the meat. Uh, but for Cain, he had no regard, which makes sense because we all know that vegetarians are the worst. You know, the ones I've encountered, you know, <laughs> all you ever hear about is how great veganism is. So, yeah, they are the worst. Love me some meat. And so Cain is not happy about this. No one likes rejection. And uh, his countenance fell, which is another word of saying he gets a little ticked off. <laughs> yes, ticked he's mad. Off. <laughs> ticked off. And he's mad about it. And again, we have one of these questions like, I don't get it. The Lord says, why are you angry? If you do well, won't you be accepted? Um, or if you do well, will you not be accepted? And again, how do, we, how do they know what's acceptable at this time? And people always ask, well, why was one accepted and one not accepted? And again, the text doesn't bring that out, but there are suggestions. Do you have any commentary suggestions? Or, um, Yeah, there are numerous reasons. Yeah, I mean, it's, the most... The path of least resistance explanation is that, you know, Cain just brought some, whereas Abel brought the fat portions. So yeah, one, like, part. bought the best, brought the best, and one just brought some. That may be the easiest or simplest explanation. Uh, I've also heard that um, that implied in God's favor for uh, Abel's offering is that his 
his task of shepherding, of guiding uh, animals around to find where food is naturally growing, mm-hmm. it's it's a trade that cooperates with the soil right. in a kind of partnership. You know, let the grass grow, you go where the grass was and you move around. Whereas uh, farming um, is more of a of a a trade that has to like force ground that doesn't want to give fruit to give fruit. Like you have to like get sharp instruments and cut and dig at the dirt and the soil and work it. And it's almost like Cain is like, you know, in the trenches with the soil battling and this wrestling match. Yeah. Doing violence to it, to get it, to produce something to, um, of good of use. And this is like a, 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 a task that directly participates in, what went wrong in the fall, mm-hmm. like the curse on the soil. So whereas Abel has this cooperative arrangement with the earth and lives at peace with it, uh, Cain has this wrestling match. And it's not that one was morally better than the other, that, that God didn't favor one because everyone should be shepherds and no one should be farmers. Mm. Uh, that's not the issue. It's that the the offering that came from a life of cooperation with creation was less curse filled than the offering that came out of in the trenches <laughs> so it should have just been a gatherer rather than a cultivator just go and gather the fruit that grows naturally rather than try to force the soil to bear what you want when you want where you want who are those people who only pick up food that falls out of trees oh foragers? Right. pescatarians or something oh, yeah i don't okay, know what the yeah. technical term is but sorry yeah. all our listeners who are like you guys are idiots <laughs> <laughs> or just you the, the guy who said pescatarian <laughs> so i mean i think it's interesting though that right after this cursing discussion we have talking of tilling the soil and god not accepting that and you know and again there's a lot of implicit things yeah. we're talking about yeah and, and it's, it's not, hard to see how far to push it it's but, not that he doesn't accept it right. as much as like uh it's he doesn't like it as much as he likes the other one. Like one has more favor because it's in more cooperation with creation and one has less favor because it's not. Both are going to be needed. In a fallen world, you need farmers. Mm-hmm. And and Adam had to work the ground and Cain picked up his dad's work and he did what people have always had to do ever since then. It's not a commentary on one is right, one is morally superior. Or they're both necessary in a fallen world. But some activities bring the marks of the fall with them and are less acceptable than others that don't. And so an example of this, this may be way too far afield with this one theory, (laughs) (laughs) but you have, you know, in, in Israel's later sacrificial system, um, you know, someone who has a physical disability isn't able to serve as a priest Mm -hmm. and offer offerings. Uh, The person has to be whole for the offering to be accepted. It's not that the person with the disability is morally inferior to the one whose body is whole. But when it comes to worship and sacrifices and offerings, the state of the offerer uh, impacts the favor on the offering. Hmm. Uh, And is the state of Cain's trade uh, place him in a different place than Abel's trade places him? Is it even, is it his, even his state of, uh, willingness to offer up the offering. Like, does, Kate, does Abel offer up a sacrifice that shows, man, God, I am happy to offer this to you. I am so grateful for what you've done and blessing the, the, the work of my hands that I'm going to give you the best. Does Cain's offering indicate a state? I'm, I'm taking the word state a little bit differently than you did, but is there some sort of resentfulness to it? It's like, well, begrudgingly, I will give you an offering. Uh, he's had to work hard to get this yeah. food like i mean he's had he's done battle with the soil that god cursed yeah. to try to get some crops mm. to grow out of it there's yeah. something about the whole narrative that led to his offering that's different than the narrative that would have led to mm. to abel's is is there one other thing i just want to toss this out real quick i know we've been on this for a while now but something i think about in terms of the larger narrative of torah uh, one of the things that God makes very clear to the Israelites is that he's the one who defines worship. What is proper worship? What isn't? Where do you worship? Where do you offer up sacrifices? Everything is defined by him. You don't get to offer up whatever you choose. You only offer up what I say you can offer up and then where I say you can do it. Is there a little bit of hinting toward that where God is saying you know, to Cain, you don't get to define what right worship is. I do. And if I say yours isn't good enough, then you have to go back and redo it because you don't just get to offer up whatever you want. I'm the one who says what's right or wrong. Don't get mad at me if I'm saying this isn't acceptable. 
Yeah, I mean, that's going to happen. Of course, in Torah, there's going to be grain offerings. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's going to be farm, you know, right. produce kind of offerings. I, I wonder if Cain's issue is not that he offered the wrong thing. He offered what he had to offer, right. what a f- farmer could bring. Uh, it's just that God had more favor on what Abel had to bring. Yeah. And what Cain's problem is that he doesn't accept the fact that um, God shows favor towards certain people for some reasons and less favor toward other people for other reasons. And accepting uh, the fact that you are uh, the one who is favored or not favored is part of learning to live in cooperation with God. Certain people are going to be blessed by God in ways that you're not. Mm-hmm. How, are you go- how are you going to yeah. respond to that disproportionate favor? Is uh, that a Jacob and Esau thing? That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Interesting. The next sons that we see fighting in the book of Genesis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think this revolves around this idea of shalom, about not just peace, but of completeness and wholeness. Going back even what you're saying with the uh, with the worshiper being completely and whole. And I think it's just kind of more, at the very least, setting up maybe ideology or even a motif of this is kind of how God envisions things, but we understand it doesn't always work that way in this world. And just I think it's just, I think it's maybe more under the surface, but something to keep in mind as it moves forward in the narrative. Yeah. So speaking of cooperation or your response to the, uh, the your response to things that don't go your way, how does Cain respond? <laughs> not so well. No, not so well. So he plots this thing where he brings his brother into the field, and it says that Cain rose up against him and killed him. So we see violence enacted against one another. Mm-hmm. Um, this is not a specific uh, cursing. Or consequence, but there is enmity described between a male and a female. These are two males. I'm not sure how far we push that as well, but yeah. clearly, we see this is not God's intention. Right. And it's interesting that the the violence is in, is enacted by the person who had less of God's favor towards the person who did have God's favor. I mean, is this a motif that's going to play out throughout Scripture? That one of the consequences of the fall is that those who really seem to, you know, to enjoy God's favor for whatever reason, either they're doing something that pleases God or God has made a choice, uh, are going to suffer at the hands of those who don't. You know, certainly something that's picked up throughout Scripture, especially in the New Testament. Yeah, and this would have been the first instance of death. Right? And I guess yeah. that would be one of the consequences of the cursing, mm-hmm. to dust you will return. This is really the first time, and and really... I mean, Abel returns to the dust so much so that his blood, you know, is crying out from the ground. Like it, yeah. it, it's like the dust is speaking <laughs> yeah. uh, as he's returned to the soil. Um, yeah, and when God, uh, when God comes on the scene, uh, he says to Cain a, a question similar to what we've heard in the last chapter: mm-hmm. "Where <laughs> is your brother?" Yeah. As was do, "Where are you guys?" Again, the Marco Polo game continues. <laughs> uh, where's your brother? And that, that line that's uh, been misinterpreted, uh, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? And the, I always tell my students the implicit answer is, yes, you are. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you are. <laughs> um, and, of course, God, knowing what has happened, as you said, the brother's blood is crying out from the ground. And then now, 11, we get another curse. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So again, we see that sin is bringing on more consequences. Mm -hmm. So the very thing he does, which is be a farmer, uh, tiller of the soil, he's going to not be able to do or do really poorly. So if he had struggled before... It's only going to get worse. So kind of a compounding of the consequences that it was, you know, God is the one who cursed the soil because of, uh, uh, in response to Adam. But now Cain has gone one step further. He's brought death, uh, shed his brother's blood, and now the soil is going to fight him even more. You're going to have to work even harder. And to me, this is a a very interesting thing to think about. I, I read an article just this morning uh, it was an interview with some comedian or actor. He was on uh, talk radio and over in Ireland, and he was just railing against God. You know, what kind of God creates a world in which children get bone cancer? Like, was like one of the things he pulled out. You know, and who is God to to judge people? You know, this unfairly. You know, do things to people that they don't deserve. 
And it seemed like a real failure to appreciate really what the testimony of Scripture is, is that the consequences people are experiencing here on earth seem to be a multiplication of our own sin that we're, that we're bringing about. And I'm not saying that you know kids get bone cancer because people sinned or something like that. But to a degree, what we're seeing in the world is not obviously God's good design, but this constant multiplication of the consequences of the fall through our own continued exacerbation of the problem through sin. Yeah. And it's interesting here you have you know, multiple components to this sin, two different humans and inanimate creation. Mm-hmm. And you know, the the relationship between uh, Adam and not Adam, Cain and his brother is connected to his relationship with the soil. Like mm-hmm. there's this interconnectedness to our existence. Yeah. It's not just a social phenomenon. Uh in in uh, disregarding his brother's life he cannot be trusted to work the soil. And, and so here, I think this is why I don't go the direction of saying, you know, God is anti-farming <laughs> uh, because, you know, it's his punishment that he will not be able, he won't be trusted to work the soil in a respected way that does dignity to God's good creation because he couldn't be trusted with the life of his brother. Mm. Um, and so the, the interconnectedness of soil in the narrative from the beginning uh, and it's going to continue really through the flood. Uh, this is an account not just about humans and their sin problem, their relationship with God. This is about a whole world that's gone out of whack. Mm, yeah. People, creator, inanimate creation, soil, animals, the works. And yeah. I would say that actually this interconnectedness is an answer to that question of why. Like, no one specifically gave that child bone cancer. Right, yeah. But we live in a world where people are taking advantage of one another and taking advantage of our world with polluting it, you know, just destroying it, manipulating it in such a way, and it causes problems. Yeah. And it causes things that trickle down to all of humanity. So no one's specifically giving people cancer. Right. But at the same time, when we have companies that are releasing toxins into the air <laughs> and they're putting things in our food because that way it makes them look better or makes them last longer, despite the fact that it has terrible... Uh, effects on our bodies, yeah. there's an interconnectedness there. Yeah. And that's a major cause of the things that are wrong in this world. Yeah, it's not God's fault. He didn't make it happen. Again, it's human yeah. beings. You know, and as somebody who likes to work the soil every summer, I appreciate the fact that farming is now being condemned. Um, <laughs> as yeah. part of my summer vacation, that's how I decompress, is getting dirty and sweaty in the soil. Oh uh, yeah. not, not you so much, right? No, but I come from a long line of farmers. Yeah, my parents, my parents' parents. You know, that's what, well, that's their background. I'm from New York. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but to the point that, that we've been making right. here, uh, also, I, it makes me think about sort of the modern sort of American evangelical view of the, the the problem of humanity in a very sort of anthropological view that you you know. Human beings are uh, fundamentally corrupted in their person, but it seems to always approach it at a very individualistic point of view, that the relationship between the individual and God has now been broken or marred in some way. And the problem that needs to be corrected is the problem between the individual and God. And modern, at least American evangelism is often, hey, you're a sinner who needs to get right with God. Your sins need to be forgiven, and, and Jesus is the Savior who produces that. Which, you know, I'm not debating that point per se, but it does seem to fail to comprehend the larger story of the Bible, which is the problem is so much bigger than an individual's relationship with God. It is, the problem is between this good creation that God created between human beings and the relationships with the other, with each other and the earth itself. And that there is a very large problem that in, in systemic problem that God is trying to correct that goes way beyond just an individual's problem that he or she has between uh, the person and God. Yeah. And God never complains that Cain has violated God. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, this is, you have done something to your brother, you have done something to your soil um, therefore, I can't trust you to be my caretaker of the soil. I can't trust you with, with the creation mandate. Uh, you're going to be a wanderer. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't say, I can't talk to you anymore, or you can't be near me anymore, right. yeah. or our relationship is now in a bad way. Uh, the focus has been in his relationship to his brother and his relationship to the soil. Yeah. And, of course, it's wrapped up in his relationship to God, but that's not the focus of the text. Yeah. Uh, which means those other things are really important to the mm-hmm. narrative and should be important to us as well. 
Yeah. I find it just interesting in light of what people say about God. It, somehow God is so holy that he can't be around sinners, or he's yeah. so holy that anyone yeah. who who kills or does any big professional sin cannot be near his presence. And here God is, shows up to the one who just killed someone yeah. and doesn't smite him. <laughs> right, yeah. And has conversation with him. Yeah. Uh, the conversation he has, it seems to be just as intimate as the conversation he had with Adam and Eve in the garden. Yeah, exactly. God, although God obviously doesn't approve to what Cain is doing to creation, to his good creation, um, God's not really hung up on what this has done to Cain's relationship to him. Yeah. Yeah, they're having a conversation. Cain doesn't like just burst into flame and turn to ash. Uh, when God you know, approaches him or has this conversation with him. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. I've heard that as well. You know, sin cannot exist in the presence of God. Uh, you know, Isaiah enters into God's throne room, or at least has a vision of it one way or another, depending on how you interpret that, and let's says... Let's say a vision of it. Let's say a vision. That's fine. <laughs> but one way or another, he's able to have this vision of God. And he doesn't yeah. burst into flame. You know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm stretching that one too far. First one that came to my mind. Yeah. Well, the, I think the point is God's response to this terrible murder is grace. Like, even though there's a curse, you can't be trusted with the soil anymore. You're going to be a wanderer. Mm-hmm. Cain responds by saying, this, is, this punishment is more than I can bear. Right. You're stripping me of my livelihood. You're stripping me yeah. of the, the way I connected to the occupation of my father. You're, you're stripping me of my identity. I can't bear this much. Plus, if I'm wandering around, someone is going to feel insecure about me walking around having killed someone. Mm -hmm. And someone is going to feel the sense of social injustice. Someone's going to feel like the world is not safe with someone like me walking around. And he anticipates a mob, a self-righteous mob, who's going to take life into their own hands in order to make the world a safer place. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. <laughs> mm, sure is. He anticipates the way self-righteous humans will act when they in- encounter sin. <laughs> and God doesn't say, uh, well, that's what you deserve. Yep. You brought this upon yourself. You do the crime, you do the time. That's right. <laughs> Instead, he responds uh, with grace and says, not so. I'm not going to let people kill you. I'm not going to let them take your life into your their own hands, even though you took your brother's life into your own hands. God responds by grace and puts this mark of protection on him. Uh, And along with that mark, or perhaps it is the mark, is this uh, promise that whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. Avenge sevenfold. Best band ever. (laughs) I like them. I don't know if I'd say they're the best band ever. They're not. But I like them. They're okay. Never heard them. Oh, Oh, John. Stop the recording. Let's take a break. <laughs> and then sevenfold and then back to it. All right. So God, again, God is responding with grace. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and this is how God leads out when Adam and Eve sin. He responds by clothing them. There are consequences. They got to know about the consequences. Mm-hmm. But God clothes them and somehow helps Eve have a baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Cain does this horrific thing and there are consequences. And yet God's grace follows again. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point. And, you know, that because when I, I get so frustrated with people, you know, I, I look around and I just see all the, the rotten things people say and do and how idiotic and stupid they are and how poorly we treat each other. And it's a great thing for the world that I'm not God yep. because I would not <laughs> agree. <laughs> agreed. Agree uh, to agree. Yeah, because I would not respond that way. I just write everybody off and walk away and, and just let it all burn. And yet God, these rebellious, sinful, and now violent person here, these people, he, yes, he said there are consequences, but he still steps in. He clothes Adam and Eve, like you said. He says, you know, I'm not going to let people balance the scales of justice here with you, Cain. You know, the social equilibrium equilibrium is now thrown off, and I'm not going to let other people try to reestablish that. Yeah, other people are going to have to learn to live in a world where they don't always feel safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yep, a tough, tough thing to hear. Yeah. yeah. And, well, and I think that there's something inside of us. You know, all human beings have this sense of, like I said, social equilibrium, that when something happens, a uh, criminal act or a civil act, something that throws off the balance, we feel this strong impulse to do something to reestablish the equilibrium. And that's what justice is all about, is something is askew and we need to make it right again. 
And that's like the Lex Talionis thing, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. You reestablish the balance. You reestablish the equilibrium. And we want to take it upon ourselves to do that. And Cain is anticipating this is going to happen to me. And God's saying, nope. Nope, that's not going to happen. Not on my watch. Yeah, and so there's obviously a lesson for us that it's that's not our job, you know, to do that. Mm-hmm. And I think really this brings up the most important question: If you are God, but you're not, thank goodness, is God an INTJ, or do you think he's a different personality? I don't know. Probably not yeah. an INTJ. Not an INTJ. I wonder I if someone think. has tried to answer I the can, questions for God I'm, and to come up with his personality oh type. I'm yeah. sure Myers Briggs or Jesus. Yeah. What, I mean, what personality would Jesus be? We'll leave it to our listeners to tell us. I'm sure somebody has tried to do okay. that. So, yes, I am an INTJ. I embrace it. So he's a wanderer, and he heads off and establishes a city. Nod. <laughs> oh, right. Nod. Nod. Yeah. Don't just, just nod. nod. No. <laughs> yes, and then we have some interlude with some you know, people are being born, apparently. They're actually taking God's uh, command to <laughs> multiply seriously. Which well, they're we doing appreciate. something right. <laughs> yeah, they're doing something right. Um, but then it, it leads to an interesting encounter. I don't know if we want to skip something you want to talk about, John, but I thought we'd get to Lamech, which is kind of a yeah important thing yeah. here. A descendant of Cain. Mm-hmm. Is it Lamech or Lamech? Where does the accent? Irrelevant. Go? I'm just curious. I don't know. Okay. All right. Lamech, probably. Okay. Good enough. Le Mech. <laughs> so this guy comes along and he says to his wives, verse 23, Adanzilla, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, 77 fold. Another great band name, waiting to be used. So we see here an escalation of violence. Mm-hmm. Uh, it started out with one brother takes another brother, um, one life for one life. God, in order to keep the mob from forming, to self-righteously rid the world of the Canes, mm-hmm. uh, he uses the threat of sevenfold vengeance. And, and God can do this kind of thing, right? Life's in his hands. He's God. Kind of gives life, can take it away if he wants. Yep. And he's just putting the threat out there, putting the disincentive out there. Like, listen, if you take life in your own hands, um, then you are picking a fight with God. Yeah. And he's going to make sure things don't go well for you. And so now Lamech, to be consistent here, <laughs> or Lamech. <laughs> Lamech. <laughs> um, Sorry. <clears throat> he ends up killing someone. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting he has more than one wife. I think this is continuing the theme of uh, the relationship between a husband and a wife is starting to break down. Yeah. It's interesting when, you know, with uh, Adam and Eve, it says that um, that the man will leave his parents' household and cleave to his wife. Yeah. Uh, if you're having multiple wives, it looks like the wives are having to leave their households and cleave to their husband. <laughs> mm-hmm. So kind of a reversal of mm, of that design. Uh, and more exploitation, I think, of of the marital uh, relationship. Yeah, accumulation of wives like accumulation of property. Kind of a you know definitely a, a denigration of the of the woman and her relationship to the husband. Yeah, and it's interesting the reason why he kills this person for wounding him. Yes, <laughs> um, some sort of offense. Yeah, I mean he's not killing someone for killing him or killing someone he knows or right. likes. He's he's doing a a stronger punishment right. to a lesser crime. Yeah. If that person, you know, broke his leg, uh, he doesn't go and break that person's leg. Mm-hmm. He is escalating it um, by killing the man. And now he is playing the role of God by saying, and if someone tries to, you know, form a mob to take me down, then mm-hmm. I will avenge, avenge them even more than God mm-hmm. would have avenged you yeah. uh, for taking action against me. I think it's interesting. You mentioned Lex Talionis, and people think of that as kind of a cruel thing, but in reality, it's a limit. So it's not just eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. It's it's all these things. So if you break my arm, I can't kill you. Right, yeah. I can only do something with your arm or whatever. You, if you knock my eye out for some reason, I can only do something with your eye. I can't, I can't increase it. And so while people think like Lex Talionis is so brutal and so harsh, really, it's a limiting factor. 
Yeah. And like John was saying here, so some You guys has, keep using the word Lex Talionis. Can you slow down to find that? Sure. It's the eye for an eye. <laughs> <laughs> the law of retaliation. Yes. Okay. That is... Uh, <laughs> so eye for eye, tooth for Lex tooth. Lex Talionis is uh, Latin for Lex Retaliation. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, the guy who fights Superman? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, Lex Luthor Retaliation. Yeah. Okay. Continue making your point. So, all that being <laughs> said, as John was saying, so here this guy, and again, this Lex Talionis has, seems to be around in the ancient Near East. It seems to be pretty standard in mm-hmm. different law codes that we come across, the Code of Hammurabi, Hammurabi being yeah. the most obvious one that people would probably recognize. And um, yet here, which this offense, whatever it was, wounding him, the response should have been a wounding, but no, he killed him. Mm. And uh, as you said, escalation, taking things into his own hands, playing the role of God. Uh, this is not quite how I think how God envisioned things to be working. Yeah. Yeah. And instead of even just trying to reestablish uh, so- social equilibrium, you have a person who wants to elevate himself. I want to have, you know, I don't want to just retaliate. Um, I want to be in the position of power now. Mm-hmm. And so it's not even maintaining harmony and balance in society, but now people wanting to elevate themselves above each other, which, again, I think is a very common human impulse. Uh, we don't want justice. We want to be in that position of advantage. Mm-hmm. And now we see that playing out. Yeah, so he's elevating himself through multiple marriages, which probably means this was a ruler. This was someone of power. I mean, poor people didn't necessarily take on more than one spouse right, yeah. <laughs> in the ancient world. It was a sign of wealth. It's something kings gravitated exactly. toward and rulers gravitated toward it the average joe uh not so much and so uh this you know we have the emergence of some primitive ruling mentality yeah and abuse of that power yeah you know not just not just ma- not just maintaining justice but really using power to uh to advance your own agenda to make yourself stronger maybe even to cow people around you into fear so that they will obey and submit. Did you say cow into fear? Cow them, yeah. Okay. Get them to cower. So the next chapter, chapter six. <laughs> what about five? The genealogy, the most important chapter. No, I meant to that. say five. I meant to start talking about chapter five, but six came out. Oh. I yeah, thought sure. we were going to skip the boring genealogy. Oh. That doesn't mean anything, and we just you know mm. rip it out of the text. You know... That's exactly the opposite of the point I was leading into. Right. (laughs) Exactly right. Uh, This is a genealogy unlike all the other genealogies in the Bible because of its unique formula. Mm -hmm. Sam, hit us with it. Oh, oh. (laughs) Which... (laughs) (laughs) I got to stop setting them up for you. Oh, boy. I was not paying attention. You were going on to your own point. Arsenal was playing. (laughs) I was checking the score. Just kidding. (laughs) Um. Yeah. What? So and so lived so many years. Yes. And then they died. And, and this, the, he died. Right. It's this death. Uh, constantly repeating it. The they really hit that everyone dies. Mm-hmm. Like no one's even though they live a long time, they still die. Uh, wow. And other genealogies are more like showing who is the offspring. Yeah. So and so lived. So and so begat. So and so and lived death. so many more years. Right. right. Where and death death is not so as important. And so. Yeah. Death yeah. isn't even mentioned yeah. in other genealogies. It's they lived for so many years, and then they were replaced by this offspring who lived so many years, <laughs> who lived so many years. And genealogies are typically forward-looking in that way. Mm-hmm. This has been called the genealogy of death because <laughs> the common refrain, the common cadence and flow is, and then he died. Mm-hmm. Yep. As uh, a way of perhaps underscoring that when God said, of the day you eat of that fruit, you, um, will die. you will die. You will die. Yeah. And that's what the serpent was calling into question. Does God really mean that? Are you really going to die? Is death really going to happen? Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a whole genealogy that's <laughs> framed in such a way to say, to say, yeah. Definitively, yes. Yeah, death happens. That's what comes of rebellion toward God's design for his creation. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, this genealogy of death kind of follows through the killing of Abel the killing of this young man, the threat of escalating, escalating violence, mm-hmm. and now a genealogy focused on death. Violence and death seems to be the prominent kind of storyline, the theme that's weaving through these chapters. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, there's a motif there. And it's going to culminate in chapter 6. Are we going to have time to dip our feet in the waters oh, of chapter 6? 
doubtful. Yeah. There's no, like, I mean, dipping would be more like uh, not yeah. even close. Uh, sprinkling, but not immersive. But it's all the, but you're, like you're saying, this is leading up to something. So people are procreating, people are coming on the earth, they're also dying. But the question we might have is okay, we see a couple of examples of not so good, but overall, are we doing pretty well? <laughs> and chapter mm-hmm. six is going to say, not so much. And in fact, things get to such a point that God is going to have to step in. Yep. Yeah. We might have to leave it there. Yeah, I think that's week. where we're going to have to gonna bra- have to break. All right. Well, thank you for joining us on this week's episode of the After Class Podcast. After Class because... The best conversations happen... After Class.